Okay. If um, there's one more person, I can't think of who it is. If they come in, that is fine too. They can just join us where we're at. I usually give people five minutes to figure it out and then off we go. So welcome everybody. Thank you for coming. There's Christine. Yay. Koala's going to go first. I, um, you know, I haven't been introducing everybody in these things because it takes time, but um, maybe we could just all say um, our names and what part of Anchorage we're from. You want to start, Koala? You're at the top of my screen. Anchorage, uh, Airport Heights. Uh, my name's Koala. <laughs> Hi, Catherine. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Airport Heights, and I have my own garden, and I keep a garden over at the Unitarian Universalist. Cool. I'm Cindy, and I'm at, in Eagle River Valley, gardening at 1,100 feet at the bottom of, of my driveway and 1,500 at the top of the property, so somewhere in the middle of there, I'm trying to grow food. <laughs> Fred, you're next. Alrighty then, Fred McClary, I'm in Russian Jack. Christine. Christine can hear me, testing. Yep. Oh, there you go. There I go, just had to figure out which button. Um, hillside, but I'm not nearly as high as you are. We're at about 900 feet growing food as much as we can. Yeah, Catherine. I'm in Fairview. Nice. Liz. She might be jumping on a trampoline. She's from Rogers Park. Oh, there you Hi. are. I am I am running bars. Um I am in Rogers Park. Hi, hi from Rogers Park. So happy from Rogers Park. Hello, hello. <laughs> <laughs> Vera. Vera's not in. Oh, there she is. Hi. I'm from, from Australia, actually. From yeah. Australia? What? Yes. I just found you by chance on, on the net, and I thought I'll um, learn how you do your gardening. I'm just very much interested. <laughs> No wonder you didn't want to join Anchor Gardens. I get it now. <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit difficult. Yeah, okay. Jenna. Hey, um, I'm actually Gina, um, and I am in Airport Heights, and I am pretty new to growing things, um, but working on it. And they're, they're coming up. They're, they haven't died yet. We're good. Great. Valerie. Hi, I'm Valerie. I'm in Chugiak on solid rock. <laughs> Except for she has lots of goat poop to share. <laughs> Ooh, I want goat poop. <laughs> All right, Koala, you're the first lovely contestant. Can you uh, share with us a little bit about what you're, how you make your soil healthy? Well, I'm not quite sure how I got picked for this because I don't know if my soil is the healthiest to grow. But I have several different spots and I've noticed, um, I'm trying to figure out why some places grow better than others. And I think I've come to the conclusion that I, my big, my big garden in the middle hasn't got enough air. It's not loose enough. I know you're supposed to no-till, but if I don't fluff it you know i've got we've got two we've got th two new gardens that we made out of old pallets that we cut in half and just put like a lot of sticks and random whatever organic matter in it and leaves and more sticks and poop and uh we have chickens with chicken poop which is like i hopefully old enough and straw and spent grain. Oh, and that stuff from the mushroom guys. 
we got at least twenty dollars worth of mushrooms out of this out of the uh, garden because at least a pound of mushrooms we got from him from the because we get mushrooms from him anyway and then that mushroom substrate stuff it just went crazy and i think the reason is because there's the pallets you know and then there's just like air lots and lots of air and it's all fluffy and and then we put you know soil on top of it and all that substrate was able to you know breathe and come out the edges and you look down in the pallets like holy crap that's like a pound of mushrooms in there <laughs> they just they did great they tasted fabulous and last year i had the same stuff and i got some in a little one pot you know big deal but i think that it's the air it's really uh very um revealing to me how and, and i push on that soil and it's got a lot of fluff and we've got now um, artichokes and um, carrots and a bunch of greens and celery and stuff growing in these two beds and they're just doing wonderfully and I I'm really believing that new collection of soil that the layers of soil and then another one we did last year kind of at the last minute the little lasagna bed is doing great too so I don't know. Uh, what what I, I like, I, I'm a big fan of um, of um, uh, compost and I, and I feed my compost all the time. I've got, I put a lot of this time of year fish parts and I'm real lucky I don't live near bears. Sorry, people in Chugiak and Hillside and Eagle River. <laughs> But I just throw the worms, I, I throw throw the, you know, fish heads and whatever out there. And I never have any trouble with bears. So, um, but it makes compost on fire. I mean, it's just like right now, it's just steaming. That and the other thing is the spent grain. If I put that stuff in there, holy cow, that is, that is the, to die for to get that stuff in there. And it, it just really makes the you know the compost good and then it makes the soil healthy you know but i am thinking i really need to redo that whole bed in the middle i mean things are doing okay but not nearly like not as as well as last year you know the greens are like that big and i would think they should be bigger than that by now um the ones in the other beds are so um learning my lessons by mistakes but it's okay because I've got Catherine's bees growing in there. They're doing just fine. <laughs> that she gave me already started beans. And um, uh, yeah, any questions? I don't know really what to say. I mean, I I wonder you know, if you need a broad fork. Have you tried broad forking your garden? Um, you know, I've got a broad fork. I use it for my um, compost to turn it. So maybe I should have done that just to put a little more fluff. Yeah, get some air in there. That's a really good idea. And so my compost teacher told me I should have sticks in my compost for the same reason, but I hate turning them. But so this, this time I did compost without sticks and I don't know, I, I don't, I'm not sure I like either one. I'd add coconut core to the, to fluff it up. You, what did you say? I would add coconut core to fluff up coconut. Um, oh yeah. yeah just, just for that volume. I mean, lots of people would use peat previously, but I think we don't want to use peat because of the environmental issues. Yeah. But 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 yeah, then you have to mix it in, but that's not horrible. Like yeah. for next year. Yeah. I put a lot a of uh, uh, manure in there this year. I put more than I ever had actually. Still finding little turds as I <laughs> go through the plant stuff like oh, look a whole little dried up horse turd, you know. <laughs> but um, yeah, I try to bust them up. Cool. Yeah. Any other comments or questions for koala? Okay. Now, Let's Catherine, you might have some some gems because you always have such a healthy garden. Yeah, let's hear from Christine. See what she has to say. 
Mm. I say compost, compost, and more compost. Yeah. I mean, I can never have enough compost. I mean, uh, our our you know native soils, if you want to call it soil, um, by classic definition, is just um, basically sand, silt, no clay for me, zero. So of course, everything has to be grown above that. And I'm learning that I should be using a whole lot more um, lime. So the pH just, because we drain so well, we have soils that are called actually podsol. Uh, that's the base layer, at least in Anchorage Bowl. And that's extremely acidic and becomes actually kind of toxic um, as it becomes more um, drain, it, it, more aluminum actually leaches. So it's kind of an interesting problem to me. So I'm not going to be broad walking super deep anymore. But I have now lots and lots of compost on top. So I'm going to keep lots and lots of compost on top of all my beds. So yeah. And uh, certainly lots of, I mean, this was like the biggest year for goat poop. Thank God for goat poop. Can't have enough goat poop. And those spent rain, of course, is amazing, I think. And then leaves, endless quantities of leaves, much to my husband's dismay. But it's all compost now, so. And yes, we find turds too. <laughs> yeah, so lime, lime, dolomite lime is my thing right now because my pH just isn't, isn't remaining um, uh, neutral enough or anywhere close to neutral, about 5.5 in most of my beds. So that's really inhibited a few things. So lessons learned repeatedly. Okay, anything else? Are you ready for questions as we go or do you wanna? I have a question for Christine. Hi Liz. Hi Christine. So can you talk a little bit about how you do cover cropping? Oh, please. How you know, the, is there enough. several ways? Well, I don't have enough land to do proper cover cropping. Is that speaker sound as bad as it sounds to me? <laughs> Not bad. It's kind of grumpy. That. Yeah, it's awful. Um, so I don't really know how to do cover crops. Um, here, because I don't have enough space. But what I would do when I had, if I had enough space, would do cover crops and, and basically just um, let it rot in the next year. Well, do you know? I'm curious. Like some of mine, I had, um, I have, like, I have cabbage planted, and I have all the cover crop around it, and then pretty soon the cover crop was getting so tall that I decided to give it a haircut. And then I just put that, that green manure all around the cabbages. But when that dries out, does that become less nutritive than it would have been had I been able to turn it in? Even though I've still got it growing around, that I can turn in, but that part I cut off, do you know, Christine? I assume when it turns brown that you, are, you do lose the nutrition, but you're leaching it into the soil then. I think so. I would I would definitely continue doing what you're doing because you don't want your cover crop crowding your plants. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Yeah. If anybody else has any uh, anything to say about cover cropping, I'd love to hear that. I'm going to go back to mute. Thank you, Liz. I have I did an experiment with winter rye one year, and I know that you're supposed to cut it down before winter comes and till it in. Did I do that? No. It came back the next year. Did I do it the next year? No. And now what I have growing there is a lovely field of clover and I'm not sure of red clover, which is better than white clover, in my opinion. And um, so I'm not sure how it got there, but it, it made whatever happened. You're supposed to cut the stuff off so that the all the vitamins and nutrients go back into the soil into their roots, and that's my understanding. And then you plow it under. So I think you might have done the right thing by clipping them off, but I don't know that. I'm just that's just my educated guess. Okay, so compost. I have a question for you, Christine, on compost. What was what was it though? 
I was turning the compost today. I'm like, I wonder what Christine does. I'm trying, I was trying to put you on my shoulder and have you teach me something. Oh, my question is, um, so I know in my worms or in other things that if there's a smell, it's gone anaerobic. So when I turn my compost and there's a smell, that's bad, correct? Um, it's composting. You know, I wouldn't say it's bad. Hmm. I mean, when it's finished composting, you shouldn't smell um, other than that lovely soil smell. But I don't like that smell when I'm turning it. Oh, I just think that's inherent in compost. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like poop. <laughs> well, everything, it just smells like, I don't know, wet dogs or I don't know, something horrible. It's probably anaerobic decomposition, which would probably end up smelling more like sulfur. And I think the reason that we're getting the weird um, echo, I think, Cindy, that's coming out of yours, that your mic is picking up your speaker, so you might want to mute. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's good for the rest of us um but that would be the difference i don't know enough about composting to know if anaerobic is bad um or if you only want air uh aerobic but basically yeah it's doing it in the absence of oxygen i think you're right so the, the more anaerobic it is definitely the more it smells so yeah i agree but i mean I turn my piles all the time. So, I mean, it's sort of like at the drop of a hat, I turn a pile, which means every day or every other day. And they, the initial bad smell goes away very fast mm -hmm. and keeping it as aerobic because I don't want it to be anaerobic. It just slows everything down and it turns to sludge. Yeah, mm -hmm. thanks. So I have a question about lime. <clears throat> do you add lime to your compost pile or do you wait and add it to your garden? Um, right now, both, because I need to adjust the pH and I need magnesium because it's been, uh, coconut core actually ties up some things like magnesium and calcium. So I think that I've actually created a problem by so much coconut core um, from, I put it in my compost bin and goes in with my worm bin. Um, but anyway, yes, I added, I mean, I love, I love adding additives to my compost while, particularly while I'm composting, I usually do the hot compost and then while I'm finishing it, I'll add any additives that I want. Oh, okay. okay. So when you're finishing that, when it's More. really cooking. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But I think it'd be fine at, while you're cooking too. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So I have a question basically for anyone and everyone, which is what metrics does one use to evaluate soil health, right? Like I know about pH, you know, I know about moisture, which you can argue is or is not soil health. Um, but what else, what else do you look for um, to evaluate, to say, okay, is this healthy for what I wanna grow? Granted, right, because different things be different, but um, how do you know what to look for? I say it should smell good. It should smell like nice, rich, um, happy dirt. Um, it should make you smile when you smell it. Um, I like to see worms, but I also have had a lot of years of accumulating worms in, all, in any area I compost. So worms, earthworms make me feel like it's a healthy, happy compost. Um, I like a nice texture too, which is that's a harder thing to achieve. And that has to do with your inputs. Um, what else? And yeah, obviously pH. Um, I can't think of anything else at the moment. Is pH probably the only thing that you would do a formal test for and everything else is like, yeah, you kind of know it when you see it. Um, yeah, pretty much. I mean, because you're going to be making compost with lots of different things, hopefully, I mean, you can, some people will compost with just two things. And that's not going to be a very healthy compost. It's not going to have diversity of nutrients. It's not going to have um, probably the right textures either necessarily. So having a diversity um, means you can probably get all the nutrients that, you, that are po possible in there. So that part's something that you really want as much as physically possible. What do we have around us? You know, what, what resources can we get? Um, I don't remember where I was going. <laughs> no, I'm not tired. <laughs> What was the rest of the question? I'm sorry. 
Oh, what, sorry, I was yeah. unmuted. Um, uh, <laughs> what was it? Oh, if pH was the oh, only thing was really oh, yeah. like quantitative as, yeah. as opposed to qualitative. Yeah, and sometimes if you see mushrooms growing in it, that's a good sign. So many people see mushrooms popping up and they freak out because they think it's a pathogen or a problem. And it's a really good sign. It's healthy, it's diverse soil. And you should see mushrooms probably sometimes, particularly compost mushrooms or what we call compost mushrooms. They're in the Copernic, uh, Copernicus family, real common, real common in there. So yeah, those would be pH mushrooms, critters. Thank you. Oh, uh, we lost Cindy. You're muted. Cindy, you're muted. Unmute. Sorry, I like to feel the soil. Um, there's diff different parts of my garden are different things. And um, the peppers, for instance, in the greenhouse, they like lots of sand. So I like to make, I like to feel the sand in that one. But I don't like to feel the sand in the tomato boxes because they don't need as much sand and drainage. Um, I want to say a little bit about calcium here. Calcium is my favorite. When you're on my tomatoes, we're going cur just, I, I just like couldn't figure it out. And I got on uh, Google and asked, you know, whoever and found out that they needed calcium. And then later I found out that that's how the minerals catch a ride to the roots. Somehow the microorganisms are asking for little sugars and they can't, the little, the microorganisms can't deliver. It has to be the calcium that takes it on a taxi. If you wanna know all that language that comes from Elaine Ingham, <laughs> who's my soil hero. Um, but so I went to the store and got a whole thing of, of Tums and crushed it all up and saved my tomatoes that, that year by feeding them Tums. So, um, you know, whatever works, works. I suppose milk would have worked, I don't know. But uh, calcium carbonate. what was that? Calcium carbonate. Yeah. So anyway, um, yeah, calcium is really important in the garden. So now I collect all my eggshells, I dry them in the oven, I crush them, I powder them in the coffee grinder, and that goes in all my all my gardens as well, because um, calcium is so important. I've, I've been doing good. My, my uh, tomatoes using um, the Arctic Organics tomato food. Seems to be a really good uh, combo of things. It's really smelly. So it must be good. If you open it up, it's like, oh, God, just do it. Get out of the greenhouse, you know. <laughs> it's, really, it's really cool. But I assume there's calcium in there. Since it's a mix of all kinds of really hard, kind of undissol undissolvable looking things. Yeah. <laughs> they don't really say, they don't give you the magic formula, they just sell it to you. <laughs> Fish bone meal base for them. Mm -hmm. It's probably true. Yeah. I'm, I'm wondering if all of you have. Um, have read the trilogy from Jeff, um, what's his name? Bowenfield? Yeah, Teeming with Microbes, all those. Have you guys read those? Not all. I've read some parts of them. Yeah, I reread one, this the first one, this last weekend. And uh, it's really good, even to reread. So um, I didn't really want to reread it. So I got it on Audible. And so I could listen to it. And that, you know, you're working out in the garden, you can listening to the seeming with microbe stuff. It's just very informative. And then you start talking to the little bugs and little things in there and say, hey, keep, keep working and doing a good job, that kind of stuff. So that's my highly recommended, besides uh, Elaine Ingham. If you watch anything from Elaine Ingham on YouTube, you're gonna get a lot, a lot of information. She's awesome. Hmm. Interesting. <laughs> so this year is our first year we have bees. And I'm and they they do seem to be 
finding the flowers. It's going to be interesting. I'm just calling them pets. I've decided they're just pets because I'm not expecting to get anything out of pollination the first year, but it's very fun. It feels really integrated in the garden to have them buzzing around out there. And they like compost too. <clears throat> they like compost? In the springtime when there's no flowers, when you first get your bees, you just might sometimes see them kind of foraging soil and compost. I, I think they're probably looking for mycelium <clears throat> that has a little bit of sugar, but I'm not sure. Hmm. But I always see them visiting the compost. Wow. Yeah, it's weird. Okay, Christine, I'm going to ask you another compost question about ethics of composting. Because I know all your medications come out of your urine. And if you're putting urine in compost and you're using it for your own stuff, it, that I can see that. But I know a lot of people that are using urine for all sorts of market gardening. And not necessarily in Fairbanks, I mean in Anchorage, but um, more in the permaculture world. And uh, I, don't, I just don't know what I think. And secondly, before I have to mute myself again, we have older than three day old urine. And I, I don't know if ammonia is good to put in there or not. Cause the way our system works, we, is it, is ammonia just as good? Oh, okay. Yeah. They spray, it just, they spray ammonia. Okay. Well, it comes down and sits in a bucket until the bucket gets full and then it goes out into the drain and I've often wondered about if I should just take that, some of that to get the compost started. I don't know. Hmm. Mm -hmm. That works well. That work, that'll, that'll make the compost go bang. But the ethics of drugs in our bodies, my God, that's such a difficult question. Somebody asked me that recently who's taking um, antidepressants. And doing a little bit of research on that, they really don't break down completely. So you basically would be accumulating and the plants actually take it up. So it's like, oh, this is like a mess. Um, <clears throat> most hormones, because progesterone and estrogen would be taken by a lot of women for um, birth control, um, those, those break down mostly. Now uh, in, in compost, but yeah, the antidepressants are a big problem. And I don't know about, you know, there's so many drugs out there. You'd have to investigate each one of them, but yeah, the, the ethics of that is really questionable to me too. I wouldn't want it in my compost. Not without knowing, you know, whether they're broken down. I mean, fungi can break down so many things. It's, it's the, thank God it's our miracle, of course. Without that, we'd be, <clears throat> Um, piled higher and deeper and shit, <laughs> literally. <laughs> right. Uh, but yeah, the drugs, they're, they're a big question. Like, and with pesticides and herbicides, I don't want those in my compost either. Some don't get broken down. Yeah, so I've, I've been telling people in Anchorage that have septic, or that don't have septic systems, it goes straight into the inlet to use their pee to, to do their lawns with you know, do 50-50 and put it at least in their lawns and they'll have the best greenest lawn ever. And people will come and ask them what their fertilizer is. But is that really, I guess it's better than putting it in the ocean. That's what I've been telling them. I think that's the best. Or yeah. feeding trees and shrubs. Right. P trees and shrubs, right. Yeah. Anything like that. But basically any non non-edible, you know, whether it's plants, flat, I mean, sorry, whether it's trees, shrubs, flowers. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. yeah. Things you're not going to eat. Yeah. Hmm. Is, if, I don't want to hog Christine. If any, you guys have other questions, please do ask them, but I got lots. <laughs> oh, Christine has lots of answers. It's great. I'm sure I don't have all the answers, guaranteed. It's still a learning process by huge, I mean, I think soil science is like, I guess I don't really care about the soil science exactly, but I need to care some. It's the biology. 
it's the it's a life in the soil, which you know obviously so many things kill. Too much phosphate kills those interactions with our muscular mycorrhizae and plants, and we need that interaction for our vegetables to grow really well. So I mean, so many things that we do um, conventionally is just that it's killed the soil. Glyphosate killed the soil. Plowing killed the soil. So it's like, it's, it's a big problem. How do we go forward? How do we, how do we manage to re rehab those lands that have been damaged? And that really is, I'm just gonna work on my little garden. I'll compost one compost pile at a time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just talk to people like my neighbor next door, she's a new homeowner and she was like, oh, uh, I, I don't know, we were talking about something and I said, uh, she said, I guess the only way to get a really good lawn is to, is to spray it, right? And I'm like, uh, no, I hope you're not spraying your yard because um, I'm here with my bees next door and that would not be good. As a matter of fact, my bees are, are, are registered with the state of Alaska. So if she hired anybody, they, they're supposed to know that there's bees. Mm. Very interesting. Yeah. Uh, but, but she's, she's great. I mean, she's not going to spray it, you know, but she's got hawkweed all over her front yard. And I'm like, you know, and she says, this doesn't seem right. I mean, it's like, it's about one third of her front yard is hawkweed. And the people who live there last time, I used to pull it out and say, you know, this is hawkweed. And, <laughs> it's an invasive species. And uh, I thought I, I thought I'd gotten rid of it, but I guess with them gone and they spent, you know, and then she's new, it's like really taken over. But she says she'll just mow it, mow it, mow it, mow it, I guess. I don't know, it's, 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 it's beyond digging it out. It's really bad. So, but you know, it's like she didn't know. She didn't know about sprays and stuff like that. And just gotta talk to people about it. Especially you get a new neighbor, you know, like say, hey, what are you gonna do with that dandelion farm you got over there? You know, <laughs> that's back there in our backyard, dandelion farm. And she mows her yard, but uh, but she doesn't know anything about really taking care of it. So, but she asks us, which is nice. <laughs> I beg my neighbors to to grow more dandelions for my bees. Yeah, yeah, I was glad because I don't really want a dandelion farm in my little bit of lawn that I have here. That's really just sort of work area, but I like to stay green, you know. So if they want to have a dandelion farm, that's fine because my bees can go over there <laughs> and uh, eat their dandelions if they want to. I mean, mm. it's you know, uh, the other day we were at Skelec Lake and they have this trail and it's, it, they have a foot cleaner thing, you know, one of those brushes and they say, please, you know, do this before you get on the trail and we'll try to keep the invasive species. And I was so excited. I'm like, look at, this is great. I mean, walking on a trail, there's no dandelions and about half a mile and I'm like, dandelion, dandelion, dandelion. I'm like, ah. You know? they're, here. they're here to stay. <laughs> they're Just so Actually, actually, mine become kind of um, sparse because we harvest them. I feed the greens to the ducks and we eat the roots. So yeah, well, they actually become them. kind of a crop. They'll eat them. Yeah, they scratch them all down to nothing. But yeah, I mean, they're healthy. But, you know, out, out in the middle of nowhere and ski like lake, it's like, oh, you don't belong here. <laughs> we do have a native. We do have a native dandelion. It does yeah, look a little different. Tell the difference. It's a big, that big, really hairy looking one. It's smaller, I think. Oh, because there's one that's like a super dandelion. Have you seen that mm. one? Mm. It's like way bigger and it's got like craggier looking leaves. It kind of lays flat. I think that's, I think that's a native. That's different. I don't think it's. Yeah, it does not look like a regular dandelion, but it does skirt up a. A dandelion looking flower. So dandelions in the compost, because they're very nutritious. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so Christine, what's a local source of lime? 
Um, I'm afraid I'm buying lime, dolomite lime. I want the dolomite because that means it has, that's magnesium. So I just buy it at mill and feed. So yes, it's a mind thing. And I do sort of ask myself regularly, what are you going to do when you can't get this? Because at some point we're not going to be able to continue mining. So um, wood ash would be the next best thing, but that's not, that's going to change the pH. That's not going to, that's going to mostly provide potassium. Right, so I've been thinking about plants that have, like I have a massive amount of comfrey, but I got, mm -hmm. the, doesn't comfrey have magnesium? I'm pretty sure, but I'm not positive, but I think it is. It's pretty anyway, well -known. I've got the kind that doesn't spread because I didn't want invasives, but now <laughs> I don't, I have a lot of bushes, but I cut them and put them in the compost and then they're pretty much done for a while. So um, my wood ash story, I was like, oh, I need to change the, the pH I'm, and I put a lot of wood ash out on my kitchen garden mm -hmm. and it's still not back to normal that was maybe five or six years ago it's it's okay but you know don't go don't do what I do I, mm -hmm. I just do things and then um you know figure start out what small. Is good about that you mean like start small yeah start small yeah I don't follow that <laughs> mm -hmm. I like to just throw my you know whatever and just start it yeah. So, uh, yeah, so that was the other one, Ash, but there was one other thing I was gonna, I'll, I'll mute myself while you guys think of more things that you wanna ask. Does, does anyone ever take com comfrey leaves and soak them in water to make a, like a tea? Yeah, that, when I was in, um, Susan and I working on a farm in New Zealand and they had comfrey everywhere and that was our job to pull up comfrey and stick them in these big barrels. And, th but they had so much of it. I mean, it was like in the woods, it was everywhere. And so I get comfrey, it's like, you know, a nice plant, like it's pretty. I don't, want, I don't necessarily want to like yak it all down and stick it in water. But we have a lot of it growing at the UUs. It actually looks like a cover crop. <laughs> If anybody wants to take some up and take it up, I think I'm going to start putting it somewhere because it's all it's all among all the vegetables we planted. There's little comfrey plants about that big, and you know, give them a month, they're going to be that. Big. <laughs> They'll be bigger than the plants that they're growing around. But nobody wants to pull them out because they're cool looking. I just chop them. I don't pull them out too much. Yeah. Well, so these are so many, hundreds of plants. Oh. Tiny ones. You know, there's oh. really hundreds of them. An invasive weed. Yeah, because last year we didn't pull them out. And now yeah. <laughs> yeah. And they, you know, they do that really well, which yeah, they're real good is at. good and bad. So koala, do you let the leaves ferment for a while in water before you use it? Or what? Well, I didn't, I've never actually done it. I've never had access to that much comfrey. I did a little like, you know, jar of it one time, but they actually let it sit there until it's just broken down and nasty looking and then use it as water. Okay. okay. It has lots and lots of nutritional benefits, magnesium, right? So I do that with all my weeds. I about once a summer, I just go gather all the weeds and dump them in a 55 gallon trash can and fill it with water. When it starts bubbling, then I start thinking, okay, it's time to start spreading this out. And uh, I dilute it though, 50, 50. I'm afraid to do it full strength. I just don't know, you know, if it's gonna be too much or too rotten or too whatever. So uh, yeah, I dilute it and spread it around. I use that slurry to charge my biochar because I, I do, and we haven't talked about biochar, but that's another soil and then amendment that seems, I mean, I still am in a pretty, pretty juvenile stage of using it, but I do so far like the improvement on my soils. It seems like that holds water better. Things are pretty darn happy, but anyway, charging the biochar is critical. If you put it on the soil, it just soak, we have soaked everything up so nothing will grow. So ask me how it. I killed, ask me how I killed my cherry trees. Really? No. I did. Oh no. Yeah. 
Fred, you want to say anything about biochar? Yeah, if you make it right, boy, it's some fantastic stuff for your dirt. How do you charge it? Quick definition of it. Yeah. What's that? Can someone define it? What is um, biochar? So biochar is burning wood in the absence um, of oxygen, basically. So you have a very high temperature. Um, it, it's charcoal. I mean, it looks just like char charcoal um, until you charge it um, with nutrients because it's an ion exchange resin, basically. So it's this open network that lots of things stick to, um, cations, and then fungi and bacteria can hang out in it. And it's basically carbon that lasts for a very long time, like basically forever. Hmm. And Fred's been making a bunch. And Fred disappeared. So if, if you um, don't, if you don't charge it, it sucks all the nutrients out of the soil, and basically, so that's what I learned the hard way. And um, but to charge it, you can do a lot of different things, and that's what I haven't even started experimenting again because I, you know, left that. In idea. with disgust. Yeah. Right. So Fred, do you charge it differently than Christine? Uh. I don't know. I uh, I make kind of a soup of uh, blood meal, bone meal, uh, um, 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 shoot, compost tea. Uh, pretty much anything that I can find that that might have nutritional value, and I put it in this fifty-five gallon plastic drum I've got. I put a sump pump in the bottom. To circulate it. Wow. And then I put air stones in the bottom to give it some air and keep that, uh, keep all those microorganisms alive. And then I've got uh, like lawnmower leaf bags that go on your lawnmower that are porous. And I put my charcoal in there and drop it in that drum and let it sit for two, three, four weeks. Boom, biochar. But you, what do you use the, the liquid for? Or the do you take the biochar out and smash it and put that around? Yeah, I, I take the biochar out and spread that around. It's smashed first before it goes in the um, soaking in the amendments. Yeah, mine is already mostly crushed, crushed when I put it in the liquid. And then I take the liquid afterwards and I pour it on my tree roots. So my next thing is about trying out, and so far my experiments have worked well in the solarium, but I haven't taken out to the wider world yet, but um, I have, I have um, bacteria, worm compost, and um, perennial, so annuals and perennial different compost for, from the worms. So when I feed the worms oatmeal and um, leaves and everything natural, then I can use that worm tea on the perennials in the solarium and they won't get aphids. Mm. But if I use the bacterial stuff, our food scraps stuff on the um, perennials in the solarium, then they just get more aphids. Oh, that's weird. Uh huh. So I started doing more research and there, so there's different composts, bacterial and fungal. And um, the bacterial fungal is more for annual plants and the fungal is more for the other way around. But um, the, the interesting part to me is the hugel culture. When you, when you build your hugels with rotten wood, and you don't charge it, if we're using a biochar word, um, it just sucks all the nitrogen out of the thing to try to break it down because you need to have greens and browns and whatever. So, so it's been interesting. I think what I'm gonna do is take that bacterial stuff and put it on the Google bed and see what happens. 
but it's so hard to write research about that or you know document because you don't know for sure that's the thing so i don't know what do you think christine or koala or any fred i don't know tell me what to do i haven't tried a hoogle pile yet it's what do you call it a hoogle bed a hoogle it's a the German word is Hugelkultur. Yeah, Hugelkultur. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's kind of like what we were thinking was happening in our, our place out in, in our, our pallet beds. Because mm. you put a lot of big pieces of tree limbs and stuff like that in the bottom. Who knows what's going on in there? But everything's growing. I haven't had anything fancy. Just water, compost, fertilizer, ant. Yeah, I have a friend with a hugel culture area and they look like the plants need nitrogen. So I'm telling them to add fertilizer. Well, I also suggested compost tea, but I'm pretty boring in my compost teas and just make the annual one. Yeah, I, I was really surprised with, you know, my friends in Canada, they do big workshops on these Google cool tours. And maybe it's different, like maybe it's different in Australia, Vera. But here things don't break down like they do everywhere else. And I can't imagine trying this in Fairbanks where it doesn't break down even if it sits outside for 10 years. So um, I yeah, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm not real sold on Google beds. I think they hold the cold. I mean, that, that, that dense wood full of moisture. So it stays colder longer. I mean, I, I did that with my beds. I made them with old, with wood basically. And it just kept everything really cold. Now it's all terraced. It's all now rock, but it does much better. So it's not Hugo culture, but it does. It is a cold climate, which is good. I don't want to be 121. Yeah. God forbid. God. All these people that moved to Portland are all the people. I have so many friends that moved to Portland or Seattle and they're just cooking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How do we deal with that when, when it happens here? You need really healthy soil. Yeah, we're really on lots of lots of um, mulch, lots of ground cover. I mean, I, I it, it is kind of a planning process because we will see it probably. You know, so for planning for drought, planning for heat, it's not easy, but still have to do it. So like I have leftover. For... I have leftover clay from building the sauna and the greenhouse. It, well, except for I'm not really done. But anyway, I have extra clay and I thought um, maybe I'll take some clay and start giving away to people and say, sprinkle this on your garden. I take it. But would you, how much though? I don't know what to tell them, a tablespoon? A, you know, I don't want to do my ash experiment for somebody else here, throw no. a cup out and then your plants don't grow. That would be horrible. No, I <laughs> start small. Oh yeah, so try a tablespoon. <laughs> And then they're like, this lady's a kook. I don't know. <laughs> so you think it's a good idea to give away clay? Yeah. Okay. It's natural clay, right? It's clay from Fairbank or from uh, your Yeah. 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 No, that would be great. I was going to use bentonite clay, but they can put additives in that. And I don't want to put that junk in my, but I'd like clay, not much, just the right amount. I know whatever the right yeah, amount whatever is. Whatever that is. Right. right. <laughs> I'll package it. Cindy's clay. Christine says it's the right amount. <laughs> <laughs> it's all my fault then. That's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, does anybody um, take their compost and put it through a, a shaker? Yeah. Yeah, I do all my seed starting with that sifted compost mm -hmm. mixed with coconut core. And mm -hmm. it works 
it works pretty well, pretty nice to have, except that you need lots and lots and lots of compost. Oh, and I do it for my carrot bed. My carrots get babied really well. Mm. <laughs> I sift mine before it goes in the compost. What? What? Okay, explain that, Fred. Yeah. I what? sift my stuff that goes into my composters before it goes in. So it's all the same size. Oh, wow. Oh, my. Wow. Well, that's, that's a shredder. <laughs> that's a shredder, yeah. That's a lot of work. Chipper. I was thinking about doing it, Fred, but I, I haven't, I'm, I don't, I, I need more chunks for more air, I think. Well, maybe you just need some sand. Hmm. How about some perlite or vermiculite? I'm trying to be Alaskan. I don't want any volcanic. No, I'm I'm kidding. I I try not to buy stuff though. I try not to. I'm not saying that I don't. I just try not to. How about clay? Clay in the in the compost? Yeah, yeah. man. Have you felt a handful of clay that's so heavy? Oh. Yeah. I think that's why they mix in so often peat and the coconut cores so things are fluffier. And I don't know what to do to replace them because they're gonna have sticky, it's pretty sticky, thick compost sometimes without that. So yeah, that's, that's an interesting problem. We do have natural peat here some places, but. Yeah, no water in the peninsula. Yeah, and some of it's falling into the ocean, so I'd harvest that. Yeah, yeah. If you go down, go down to Mud Bay uh, along Ketchmack Drive, and it's all laying there on the. <laughs> I used to have a house there, and you could just it, the whole house was on peat, the whole the whole bluff, and it's all falling into the bay. Yeah. What about moss? Could you use that as a fluffy-ish component? I just don't know. I think it would decompose, you know, because it's it's a it's a vegetable, <clears throat> basically. But yeah, I was thinking the same thing. It's like, oh yeah, moss, that would be really nice, wouldn't it? But no. No. Nice try, Jenna. <laughs> Hey, as a newbie, the fact that I was in the ballpark, I'm calling it a win. <laughs> well, I, this has been great for me. I got a lot of thoughts. I, I like to talk about this kind of stuff with other people and you guys are great. You've given me confidence to it's go fun. on and try yeah. other new things. Yeah. But, um, Interestingly enough, um, Jody is has a thing tomorrow on soil testing mm. at the Matsu Experimental Farm. So if you want to do, I don't know who's teaching that. I, I'm, I've am i been still trying to get a, a hold of Steve Brown, who said last week's thing, he said, um, no-till works everywhere except for Alaska, and I have the research to prove it. But he's not answering his phone. He said, call me. I want to talk to you about it. But but I can't get him to call me back. So I guess he doesn't want to talk about it. I, th I think probably he doesn't want to talk about it. But anyway, it is almost 730. Are, are we, do we have any last things to say? I do. I have yeah, to make a shameless plug for Alaska Salmon Fertilizer Live Probiotic Infusion. Hmm. It's the only fish fertilizer that is made from Alaskan salmon, particularly cook in like salmon. Um, they collect the carcasses from the dip netters and run them through a grinder and then create a live probiotic infusion. And right now they used to have it at Southside, but they don't have it there anymore. So you have to call Ryan and I put his number in there. But um, 
don't follow directions on the container. You can use this in just like minute amounts and it's a great soil amendment. Um, anyway, so just Leslie Toast, if you wanna know more about it, call Leslie Toast. She just adores it. I got so, some and I left it outside and the bears ate it. So don't leave it outside. <laughs> Uh, is that the one they slept on and then ate it? No, he, I don't know. Now that I'm thinking about it, he actually likes to um, eat all, I left a plain old milk jug out there and he chewed that up the other day. So I think they just decide they want to try to chew things. I'm not surprised they ate it because it doesn't really smell like fish. No, it doesn't smell like it. So I don't know. Thank you guys. I'm going to sign off. Thank you so much. Yeah, it was great. Thanks. Thanks. Lots of info. Bye bye. Yeah. Thanks, right. you guys. It was fun. Thanks, bye -bye. Vera. Thank you, everyone. Everybody. Bye bye. Bye. Bye.